So with inve- infectious diseases that uh, don't have a high brand value, uh, it's an interesting problem, right? Because um, you 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 um, you don't want to make cure dependent on publicity. On the other hand, we all know that when you pay attention to certain things, um, you kind of that's where the resources will flow. Uh, and I think the Gates Foundation has been and others, the World Health Organization uh, and other groups, have been very conscious of the fact that um, that lots of people are suffering around the world from things we know how to combat, but we don't have the political or social will to do so because, you know, you're, I guess people talk about donor fatigue, right? Or you can talk about compassion fatigue, that you, after you worry about um, HIV, AIDS, and di- diarrheal diseases, malaria, and uh, and all. What, what do you still have enough care? We're betting in this class. Yes, you do have enough care, and you have enough uh, bandwidth intellectually to want to understand these things and to understand um, that people are dying unnecessarily in parts of the world that aren't getting uh, enough attention. These are things we can change. In my notes, you see me looking at my iPad uh, from time to time at my notes to make sure I don't give you misinformation. Um, in my notes, the heading of these slides, when I've talked about each of these areas, is what we can change, colon, <laughs> malaria. What we can change, colon, uh, infectious diseases, etc. What we can change, what we can change is, that that's the, that's the message I want you to hear. It's not just that these are intractable diseases or uh, you know permanent parts of the landscape. They're not. Uh, we, we can change them. And another one, that, again, we know how to combat, but still wrecks havoc, is pneumonia. We know how to fight pneumonia. Um, and I, I bet in a course of this size, there'll be thousands of you who've already had pneumonia um, and have recovered from it. But around the world, and again, it won't surprise you by now, especially among children under five, um, um, pneumonia wrecks havoc. Pneumonia uh, can be a, a death sentence. Um, now, here there's a good story to tell. In the last 20 years or so, we have cut the death rate from pneumonia in half, and that's very impressive. Um, and the other thing that's, that's important to know is that vaccines against pneumonia uh, are uh, proven to, to work, uh, and, uh, and they're not expensive. Uh, and um, they can be a key tool to um, protecting the vulnerable against uh, pneumonia. Getting the vaccines into the hands of the people who are most likely to succumb to the diseases is a challenge, is a challenge. Um, uh, Because in the poorest countries of the world where these things are the most dire, their uh, delivery systems, rather either through the government or through uh, independent organizations, are the weakest. But that we can change, right? That's what we can change. We can change delivery systems because now we know what to deliver, what kind of antibiotics or what kind of vaccines for preventative care to deliver to deal with pneumonia. Another thing we know how to change, we know how to fight, is tuberculosis. Um, now, the global uh, TB rate uh, over, uh, uh, let's say, the period from 1999 to 2009 uh, uh, fell by 35%. So more than a third of uh, the t- t- tuberculosis uh, rate was uh, taken out um, in the r- roughly the last decade of the 20th century and the first decade of, of our own. But TB remains one of the leading causes of death ar- around the world. There are almost 9 million new TB cases every year uh, around the globe. Now, uh, you probably are aware that tuberculosis uh, is a a sad partner of HIV. Uh, Those countries with the high HIV rates uh, are also countries where tuberculosis uh, infections have accelerated um, uh, since... uh, uh, the last few years, we have seen uh, this uh, uh, noxious cocktail of tuberculosis uh, and um, HIV uh, come together. In 2010, it's the data I have here in front of me, over 200,000 people died uh, from this co-infection of tuberculosis um, and, um, and HIV. But again, we know more now about how to diagnose uh, and how to treat uh, uh, and even how to prevent tuberculosis. 
Uh, we know how to do it. Uh, we know how to, we have been able to bring the price down in many cases for getting vaccines to people. Um, uh, what we now need uh, is a commit, a social and political commitment uh, to uh, create an infrastructure of delivery systems that would put the vaccines here, you heard me say this so many times now, put it in the hands of the people who need it the most so that they have a chance to lead lives of purpose, of choice, and of freedom. Uh, you can't do that when you're suffering from uh, these kinds of uh, deadly diseases. Thank you, and uh, we're delighted to be here to present on what we think is actually a, a quite a new issue. Uh, so Daniel Kahneman uh, was a recent Nobel laureate and he won the, the prize for economics and he has a book out called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in it he describes two ways in which people think. Um, uh, when we think fast it's an immediate emotive reaction, it's very guttural and, and, and we know how we feel about it immediately. When we think slow, we think rationally. We put all the figures together, make calculated decisions uh, about how we want to act, etc. cetera. Um, I, for one, personally think that we all are, are fast thinkers and, and are more emotional than, than rational. So when we were putting a cause forward and, and fighting a cause, we decided to fight it on both fronts, the rational side and the emotional side. Um, can I have a show of hands to see how many people know what neglected tropical diseases are? Oh, a few informed people in the house. Um, so as, as the sort of nerdy public health physician, I'll, I'll give you a few facts about neglected tropical diseases. Not too many people have heard about it because they affect the bottom most billion people in our societies. That's people living on less than $1.25 a day who don't live in huge capital cities but very out far in rural and remote, far, hard to reach areas. These people have no access to water, sanitation, electrification, and all the utilities that we take for granted. And as a consequence of that, they are more prone to and have a greater number of these infections. Um, now, there's many of these diseases, but the seven commonest are three intestinal worms, roundworm, hookworm, and whipworm. There's two blinding infections, trachoma and onchocerciasis, or river blindness. There's um, elephantiasis or lymphatic filariasis and schistosomiasis or bilhartia. I'm not going to ask anyone to say the names. Um, you, sh you should go do a, a show of hands for their favorite. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, but here's the kicker. It only costs 50 cents per person per year in order to treat these diseases. 50 cents per person per year. And it's a wonderful public-private partnership uh, with the pharmaceutical industry who are donating all the drugs and we have great technical experts uh, that actually help to, to ensure that these drugs get to the people that require them. So now we need to create the movement to ensure that it's seeded in the public consciousness and that enables us to influence policy and get more money for the cause for essentially a voiceless community. And that's where these two experts come in. And so what we're going to do is first play a video uh, to, to, to show how we got the emotional reaction going, and then we'll speak to our panelists.
want to see the end of this as much as I do. The great news is, is that we can. All it takes is a simple packet of pills. All it costs is 50 cents. To treat and protect a child for a whole year against all seven of these diseases. What's even more amazing is that if we all join in, we can see the end of all of them by 2020. Join in and be part of something huge by liking N7 on Facebook, making a small donation and spreading the word by telling all your friends. Together, Together we, we can see the end. end. Thank you. No matter how many times I've seen this video or even seen actual cases out in the field, it, it gets to me all the time. And David, what was the creative process that actually led to this, this video? Well, our biggest challenge was that these aren't very user-friendly images to um, put in front of a public. And um, our challenge was that no one really knows what these diseases are. So to start talking about them, we ran the risk of people just recoiling and finding them repulsive. So we wanted to build an emotional engagement with uh, our audience so that we could create a little bit of suspense and engagement. So we're investing in, in, in them from the point of view of getting their attention. And then we could uh, communicate our message. And we did that in a way whereby we actually built some empathy uh, with the celebrities who we used. Um, and the reason it looks very uh, like a home video is that we were literally catching these um, artists at the end of their PR junkets or uh, at the end of their filming. So we were literally taking a camera and saying, can we play a video for you and just film your reaction? And to our amazement, they, they, they agreed and they allowed us to use these. So they're genuine emotions. And uh, it's these emotions which we feel which actually connect us um, and drive us to do something. So we didn't want to just publicize the fact that these diseases are out there. I mean, the really shocking thing is that there is a cure, and it's such a small amount of money. You know, you could go and buy a cappuccino, and for that amount of money, you could save uh, or treat five um, children for a year. Get a cab to the airport, and you could look after a whole community. So we're talking very small amounts of money. But we needed to engage people and to get them feeling truly emotional about the cause. The other thing is that rather than, you know, run the risk of people not understanding what all the names of these different diseases are. We, we knew there were seven diseases that uh, could be treated, so we called the campaign N7. So we can end seven of these diseases in, uh, in seven years, which is an amazing thing to do. Which in seven years, we could take some huge groups of people that one step closer to um, ending poverty. And so, our campaign line was together we can see the end. And what we wanted to do was to build up this theme of togetherness, which many of the speakers have spoken about. But the idea is that anyone in their small way can contribute to this campaign. So we've had loads of creative people come with ideas, offering their time for free, filmmakers, voiceover artists, animators, fashion designers, people saying, how, how can we help? So the whole collective here of together we can see the end is well, tell us, what can you do in order to communicate this message and end the suffering of so many people who are devastated by these diseases? Uh, it, it sounds like it, it was an incredible journey to get to the point that led to the production of this video, but I guess that's just the start of a new journey, which is once we get the materials, how do we get it out there? And Peter, tell us about how you've sort of worked with this campaign. Yeah, so um, I run Upworthy, which is a, a media site dedicated to drawing attention to the most important issues in the world um, and making them as shareable as some video of a guy jumping on his bed and falling out the window on YouTube. Um, and, you know, what we've found is that emotion really matters. And emotion matter. like, I, I think most people know that, but the type of emotion matters as well. And I think this video could have gone wrong in so many ways and almost did. And it's kind of that, that dance that makes it so compelling. But what you said about drawing in the empathy early um, I think is so important because we find that it's really active emotions that get people to share. Everyone wants things to go viral other than roundworm. But uh, uh, like the, the real key is dealing with active emotions, emotions that get you to like sit forward in your chair and do something, and those are outrage and shock and 
happiness and inspiration. Um, a thing this video could have done and gets close to at points, but you already have the, the audience is, um, is sort of deal in disgust, where you see these like disgusting worms and you want to curl into yourself. That doesn't make people want to share the message, but you bring it around. And I think when we saw the video initially, it just seemed like, oh, you know, if it's 50 cents a day, we can help a few hundred thousand more people see this and help make a difference. And uh, you know, just the fact that it ends with an inspirational, uh, clear path that you like go in and come out and just seemed very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's been one of the really compelling things about the message, because I think we heard about many challenges today uh, or uh, over the next day or two. Um, and, and some of them seem easier to tackle and some of them seem really daunting. Um, so, well, David, you, you could be working and applying your creative talents to anything. And what particularly drew you to this cause? Well, I've worked on lots of different charities in my career, and um, all of them are worthy in lots of different ways. But what I found was really exciting about this was that there was an end point. It, we described it a little bit like those, um, those big thermometers you have outside churches when they want to raise money for a new steeple or something. And bit by bit, you see it get it closer and closer. And we thought, wow, well, this is amazing that in seven years we could actually make a difference. And seven years is a very short time frame. And it suddenly became very exciting that as we saw more and more people um, look all the way through the video, which is quite amazing for us because there is an opt-out button where you can click see the end. But I think it was about 80% of people saw it all the way to the end. And then donations started to come in. And then it got a huge amount of coverage on Twitter, Facebook, and so on. And we thought, wow, suddenly we're starting something which is exciting. And then people were contacting us saying, well, how can I help? So we feel that we're right at the beginning of something really special. And so for me, that's what's exciting about this particular um, campaign. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Peter, I think a lot of people who are championing causes and movements think about how can their materials go viral? And you know, if we could almost reverse engineer that process of things going viral, and I know you don't have all the secrets to it, um, but if you could share a few pointers on, on what those elements would be to, uh, to, to help promote or create that enabling environment for something to go viral. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I mean, it, there are a couple of things. One is it's so hard to make a great thing like you did that a lot of people cross that finish line and think, oh, I've written this great expose or I've made this great video, like I'll let the internet do the rest. And uh, I think Upworthy and a lot of other people are, in the, are trying to help as well. Uh, focus a lot on, all right, let's take that as the starting point and go from there. And how do you distribute stuff? How do you build an audience and engage them over time? Um, my past life, I was editor of The Onion, and I was always been obsessed with headlines uh, from that. And it turns out that the difference between a really good engaging headline and a, you know, a normal headline that just some people click on when they see it on Twitter or Facebook is it's not 5 or 10%. Uh, it's 100% or 600% as far as how many people see this great video that's been made. So um, I think being obsessed with, like, how do you actually package this? How are people going to come across it in their Facebook stream? Is it going to get their attention? Is it going to seem interesting? Um, we focus a lot on just generating curiosity. I think most people don't wake up in the morning, except people in this room, and want to let, change the world that day. I think most people are busy with their lives. And so you have to catch them and draw their attention. And once you get their attention, then I think people are, are mostly good. So uh, draw them in, and then give them the emotion to spread it back out. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, I, I just want to give a few concluding remarks about the cause of NTDs. And, and you, uh, you heard how we actually moving this forward. Uh, so we, we certainly have all the data and information to say economically it's the most cost-effective intervention. It's linked to all the MDGs, and so it enhances the programs for uh, nutrition and water and sanitation, maternal and child health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But many of us in the NTD community don't actually feel it's about neglected tropical diseases as opposed to neglected communities. And if we heard about the causes today on access to clean water, electrification, sanitation, food, nutrition, microenterprise, etc., it's the very same communities. So we see the N7 campaign as, as a vehicle to actually raise attention to these communities. And once we mainstream that in our collective consciousness, like every movement, we'll be able to tackle this, attention, uh, this issue. 
So thank you for your attention. I've, I've talked about what we can change. TB, malaria, infectious diseases. These are things we can change. How can we change? One is creating a social consensus. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Jim Kim talked about this in his remarks at the Social Good Summit, creating a social consensus, a social movement um, uh, that uh, builds concern at the global level uh, for eradicating uh, extreme poverty. Uh, we need the will of people who are not living in places of extreme poverty. We need their care, their will, their resources, and their political commitment to fight these horrible but preventable diseases. Um, you will have people say, but it's not in my interest, it's not my problem, I'm you know, sitting here in my nice office talking to a fancy video camera, why should I be concerned? You should be concerned about it because there, we have moral ties to our fellow creatures on the planet, and you could be concerned about it because the places of high disease and high poverty are places of social unrest. They are breeding grounds for violence. They are places that are contagious with anti-political, uh, uh, anti-social uh, movements that undermine the world uh, structure um, and, uh, uh, and uh, can infect all of our lives. Uh, I mean, I prefer to emphasize the moral commitment, the moral obligation that we feel uh, when we know uh, a fellow creature is suffering and we are aware of that suffering. I, I hope we feel a moral imperative to try to do something about it. Um, and not just as individuals, let's say I can send $10 or I can send $100. Uh, no, it's not just that. It's actually participating in building a social consensus so as to bring resources to bear on the things we know how to change already, right? The, the things we know how to change already. Changing the course of human health by using the science, um, uh, 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 using the technology already at our disposal. The other thing we can do is provoke care. I mean, that's a, my heading for this, for this section of my remarks is to provoke care, to try to tell stories to other people about um, the, the fate of a, a small child uh, who's uh, born in Southern Africa, uh, who actually is um, uh, robust and, and uh, running around and, and playing and, and, and uh, beginning to, to learn to, to read. And suddenly, because of improper sanitation, drink some water that has microbes that cause an infection, and suddenly this kid has diarrhea, has a stomach problem, like many people in the developing world. They have stomach problems, eat too much, eat the wrong thing. But suddenly, this kid who's living in a small village south of the Sahara, this kid's minor stomach problem can set off a chain of reactions that make it more and more likely that he won't survive until his sixth birthday. Make it more and more likely that he won't go to school. Make it more and more likely that then he'll get a respiratory infection. Make it more and more likely that then he'll have a heart condition. Make it more and more likely that he won't be able to live to adulthood. These are the kinds of stories, these are the kinds of real life examples that we need to make more people aware of so as to provoke their care and not just their, their intellectual uh, uh, understanding. Uh, we need them to understand behind these big numbers of hundreds of thousands of people dying uh, of horrific diseases there are stories of, of, uh, of mothers dying in childbirth, of little children uh, not reaching their fifth birthday, of people, because the water is not clean in their village, um, uh, don't have uh, uh, the opportunities uh, to grow, to learn, uh, to experience. We also have to marshal resources. Uh, we have to become aware, we have to provoke care, and then we have to marshal resources. Wealthy nurse nations, and world organizations can work together with private enterprise and other not-for-profits to bring resources to bear uh, uh, in those areas that need them the most. Sanitation, absolutely crucial. 
preventative care, and basic nourishment. These are the things, they're not that expensive. If we can find ways to bring them to the countries that need them the most, we will systematically reduce these rates of morbidity that I have been describing to you. So I'm here with Dr. Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University to uh, talk with us about uh, poverty, uh, global health challenges, and what we can do about them. And Dr. Sachs, Sachs, thank you so much for being part of our Wesleyan Coursera class, How to Change the World. It's a, a great course and exciting to be with you. So thank you for having me. So let's get started. Uh, in our current situation, there's um, uh, increasing prosperity, there's increasing economic development in much, much of the world, but also increasing inequality. And as someone who's worked uh, in this field for a long time, how, how do you see our current situation where you have economic growth, but you also have um, uh, this uh, bifurcation of, uh, of the rich and the poor? Well, the, the world moves at very different speeds. Some very poor countries are uh, achieving rapid economic development. They're using new technology, maybe a favorable geography, a new industries that have started. Other very poor countries are in a desperate situation and actually worsening. So one doesn't want to uh, oversimplify a complicated picture. In general, I believe that we have the capacity, the tools, the global wealth mm -hmm. to help all parts of the world bring extreme poverty not only under control, but basically down to zero in this generation. On the other hand, it's important to say that won't happen by itself. Right. This has to be a deliberate and chosen path in order to achieve that. So, so uh, the, the debate has gone on for some time now between those who see our uh, a, a chosen path to help the uh, folks get out of extreme poverty as actually having pernicious consequences, uh, creating dependency rather than liberation, uh, who talk about a, uh, not instead of a poverty trap, a kind of dependency uh, morass. And uh, I just ask you to comment on that, you know, and how, how you, how you, that debate has gone on for a long time. Are there new voices? Are there interesting, is there interesting data about the debate now that, that you take into account as you think about uh, uh, economic development and, 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 uh, and the responsibility of wealthy countries to do something about poverty? Well, the, the evidence that I take into account is history. Yes. Uh, both uh, long-term and, and recent. My view is that every country and every one of us at some time has needed some help. Yes. Uh, we all need it uh, when, when we're young and dependent. Uh, that's to help us so that we can become uh, independent and supporting others. Countries also need help. The United States uh, would not be a country were it not for yes. France, uh, which helped uh, the, uh, even the Revolutionary War effort. And, of course, the U.S. helped Europe. After World War II, uh, the U.S. helped uh, Japan uh, after defeating Japan in World War II. Uh, the U.S. helped Korea on uh, the early stages of what became a, an incredible takeoff. Right. The U.S. Uh, and uh, others helped India in what was called the Green Revolution uh, experience uh, from the mid-1960s onward. So when you look at history... Uh, you find that uh, it's simply not true, the self-made country right. or the self-made individual. Now, recently, uh, we have some very clear data because this argument has uh, been a, a, a strong one. And 13 years ago, I was lucky to head a commission for the World Health Organization, which advocated a major scaling up of help for health. Uh, mm -hmm. to fight the pandemic diseases like AIDS, TB, and malaria. And now, 13 years later, the results really are in. Uh, the aid in that case did go up, and the results have been very, very strong. Uh, very tough-to-fight diseases like malaria uh, have come down sharply, uh, and you can link it to specific initiatives of the global community working together with low-income countries. So I, I think that the experience uh, is good. What I would say, however, is that the critics of aid are also right when uh, to, to say for sure that 
simply adding money to uh, a situation doesn't necessarily solve anything. Aid is itself a, a, a process which requires expertise, good diagnosis, accountability, mm -hmm. transparency, rigor. Uh, so there's nothing that should be taken as casual about this. I view the aid process as a contractual relationship. Uh, where the rich countries give it because it's the right thing to do morally, but it's also the right thing to do for the kind building the kind of world we want. But the recipients can't just say, we're poor, leave us alone. Right. I believe that there needs to be strong conditionality, not micromanagement, but conditionality in the sense that we are helping you. You have to demonstrate good performance, transparency, accountability, uh, the ability to monitor what's happened, and so on. And so it is a mutual responsible relationship, in my opinion. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the recent effort to create um, small-scale controlled experiments to uh, test the benefits of specific interventions uh, especially around the intersection of disease and poverty, and um, what you've learned from these interventions, um, and what you, th how do you think it will affect um, uh, how uh, we, uh, uh, the World Bank and wealthy nations, will um, uh, use their resources to combat uh, poverty and disease in the future? These uh, uh, randomized trials, so-called, can can teach some things, especially when the question is whether a new intervention, say a new medicine or a new diagnostic or uh, a, uh, a new uh, vaccine works. Right. Uh, that's a classic case for what's called a randomized clinical trial or a randomized control trial. Uh, there are other circumstances where you're dealing in a very messy environment where I've learned that that's not the best tool necessarily, where the question is much more of an operational sort. How do we uh, help delivery? Uh, how do we work to scale up a, a, a solution that has already been proved by one of these RCTs? In that case, other kinds of tools will be needed. I, I've noticed uh, that as the economics profession has come to uh, bring in RCTs, it also has come somewhat naively to say that that becomes the only methodology. The truth is there are many, many ways to learn and many, many ways to design and to develop new approaches. Most of the technologies we use, like the video conferencing that we're <laughs> on right now, the computers and so forth, did not emerge in randomized clinical trials. They emerged in a very different kind of design and development process. So. I just urge a multiplicity of methods, but I do strongly urge one key thing, uh, that uh, people should get out there and do things. Yeah, uh, it's not enough to theorize. Uh, theory without the practice has two problems. One, it doesn't produce results. results. Right. Second, it's not even good theory most of the time uh, because it's not as if life moves from clear concept to implementation. The implementation phase is a vital part of learning what to do itself. So it's a, it's learning by doing. It's trial and error. Uh, it is a kind of experimentation that's less formal. Uh, it's building multidisciplinary teams to uh, try different uh, approaches. Uh, there are many, many techniques, and I think we're in an exciting period because there's a lot that can be done. And especially as information technology becomes a base for a, a lot of uh, new activities that are going to make a big difference. We have a lot of design opportunities yes. to use these technologies effectively. I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Professor Jessica Cohn at, at uh, Harvard uh, School of Public Health, who actually was a Wesleyan alumna, uh, I, which I only discovered once we started talking, uh, uh, that uh, about her work with uh, mosquito nets and the trials she ran, uh, which I, she, she described much in the way you just described having an openness to different possibilities. In other words, there were people who said, well, human beings always will value only what they pay for. And then other people said, no, you should never make people pay for 
the things that are essential. And uh, I, I guess I, I don't know if she would describe her, her approach was agnostic or just open to various possibilities. And in the end, they found the truth was somewhere in between that actually, um, uh, um, that it wasn't always about uh, make. It was, certainly wasn't always about making people pay for things, um, uh, but it was a, a combination of education um, and access, um, to, and education and access to very uh, effective materials that people, if they learned how effective they were, they were very likely to use them. And if they use these mosquito nets treated with insecticide, that the um, uh, the chances of of bringing down the rate of malaria infection were really very good. I, well, I, I think she uh, did a lot to help convince uh, economists of the right thing. But I, there's, there's a little bit more to the story, actually, mm -hmm. that is quite interesting. I, I was one of those who, from 2000 onward, said, let's give out these nets. Right. Uh, and uh, I campaigned very hard. Some of my colleagues said that's very unscientific, uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, you haven't done the randomized trials. But there were a lot of reasons to know, actually, uh, from a different kind of knowledge. Yes. From working on the ground for 25 years, from working with malariology, from analogies with vaccines and many other uh, reasons to know that uh, there was a, an overwhelming cost of delay. Millions of kids were dying. That, that, uh, that's right. There, there's a factor that people sometimes neglect to bring in. When you have a control like that, there is a cost of delay built into your process. Exactly. This was a disease claiming one to two million lives per year. And I was working with malariologists on the ground with the generations of experience. And they all said, let's go for it. Finally, before Jessica's... Uh, you know, paper was published, the world did change the policy to a mass distribution between 2008 and 2010, 300 million bed nets were given. I had worked very, very hard and fought a lot of battles for that. Malaria is now down by half. There are many kinds of knowledge. Uh, there is formal knowledge, there's a demonstrated trials, but there's also the knowledge of practice and, and experience and the fact that leading malariologists uh, were telling me for years uh, why the Nets had to be given out, given their experience. 